Good evening. I'd like to call to order the August 11th, 2022 Planning Commission meeting. With a roll call, please. Here. 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 Uh, and I would entertain a motion to approve this evening's agenda. Motion to approve. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. And we'd like to look at, um, so do we have minutes? Yes, we do. Approval of the minutes. Well, it's um, from our last meeting. Oh, July 14th, 2022 meeting. Motion. I move to approve the minutes from the July 14th meeting. Second. Second. All Commissioner Deal abstains, please. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 Hearing no um, negative, we will motion carries. Um, at this point in time, we'd like to open up the floor to anybody who wants to speak to items that are not on the agenda this evening. So if you had something you came here for that is uh, not considered uh, part of our agenda, we would ask you to at least raise your hand now and then if we can double check with the Zoom. None, seeing none, all right. And then we will uh, move into our first item of new business. And I'll start out here as you come up. So I will now open the public hearing on a request for a temporary use permit as a precursor to a permanent use of Rocky Mountain Tap and Garden. Uh, the purpose of the hearing is to receive evidence regarding the application materials and provide a public forum for all interested parties who wish to comment on this request before the Planning Commission. The procedure for the public hearing will be as follows. First, there will be a presentation and testimony by city staff, followed by questions from the Planning Commission to staff. Next, we will have a presentation and testimony by the applicant, followed by questions from the Planning Commission to the applicant. After these two presentations, members of the public who have joined this meeting by computer or telephone or in person may speak regarding the application. Anyone who would like to speak is asked to fill out a speaker card available at the end of that table there. And uh, if you are on computer or telephone, um, you can use the raise hand function for the computer or star nine if you're calling in by telephone. Comments are limited to three minutes per person. The purpose of public comment is to receive public testimony. And it's not a forum for debate or dialogue. Commenters are encouraged to raise pertinent issues and may ask questions for clarity However, these questions will not be directly answered during the public comment period. The applicant and staff will then be allowed to make a closing statement. I will then close the public hearing and no further testimony or other evidence will be received unless the commission decides to reopen the hearing. The planning commission will discuss the matter and may approve, approve with conditions, deny, table, or continue to a future meeting. Public hearings are recorded for the public record. All testimony must be presented after stating your full name and address. Does anyone participating in this hearing object to the proce procedure I've described? Seeing none, I'd ask for a notification. Good evening, Chair Brown Eisen, Planning Commission. Public notice has been met per the municipal code requirements. Thank you. Do any planning commissioners have disclosures? Seeing none, thank you. Great. Um, thank you for your attention on this one this evening. This is a consideration of a temporary use permit as a precursor to a permanent use for the business operating at 10...
improvements or improvements that would be installed related to the use, we require approval of a PUD or SRU, kind of whichever is appropriate, to allow the development and, and operation of the outdoor dining use on this lot. So um, in anticipation of the development that will require public hearings before Planning Commission and City Council, it will go through the full entitlement process. This applicant requests approval of a temporary use as a precursor to the permanent use. Um, within the code, staff has the ability to authorize a 30-day timeline, which is really pretty minimal. Um, that, in this circumstance, is not sufficient. So here we are in front of you. Through the code, Planning Commission has the authority to allow this type of temporary use permit for up to a year through the public hearing process. Um, typically, this staff finds that this type of temporary use as a precursor to a permanent use requires the approval of the PUD to be in place. However, we're recommending an exception to that because this is in support of an existing operating restaurant um, and because they've already begun to install the improvements. So if you've driven by there recently, you're probably seeing some of these improvements already beginning to be underway. Um, one, and you know, one other point on that too is it's not installing you know, a building per se, right? So this temporary use is a precursor use. In this manner is, is pretty different than the type of development that we normally see with a PUD, right? Which authorizes complete construction of a building. So I think there were some unique circumstances around why staff was comfortable bringing it forward in this sequence Given that they had started work, we wanted to try and you know, get an existing business open and operating with a valid approval. Um, within the packet, you'll notice that the timeline that the applicant requested was 90 days. And late this afternoon, we emailed you a revised request to allow this for a period of up to nine months. So staff and the applicant are concerned that the 90-day time period is too short to get completely through the public hearing process for this temporary use extension as well as for the PUD amendment. Um, I do want to note that their PUD application is in. We're still just kind of making sure that everything's complete. So we've left the condition of approval on there. But they, we do believe that they're diligently working toward getting this PUD amendment in place. Um, in response to a question from Chair Brownice earlier today regarding you know, how are we changing the time period from between when we've published the packet to where we are today, um, I think that's at Planning Commission's discretion if they feel like um, changing this at this point in time during the hearing is acceptable, recognizing that the notice for City Council has not occurred yet. We will be noticing this then before a same public hearing and we would revise the notice to read a nine month extension. Um, for this temporary use permit. And so um, we're supportive of this change at this time. However, if planning commission's not supportive, you know, you could recommend approval of the 90 day given, you know, that that is what was noticed and, and um, um, presented in the staff report. And, you know, that could get revised as it goes forward to planning or to city council. But just want to acknowledge that, again, another unusual circumstance. We just want to make sure they have time to get this completed. We can talk a little bit about the development that's proposed on the site. So, um, as far as what would be allowed. Hey, it's Luke. Yeah. Can you push your microphone a little further away? I think yeah. all of our mics are a little bit hot tonight. Get any some feedback? So So the actual development that would be proposed under the temporary use
I, I was just curious to hear how that is. I think that's liquor laws more than anything else at that point. Curious how it's going to work though with, um, right? I'm, your facility, you have a kind of a self-service beer taps, so people are going to be moving back and forth yep. somehow between that, and that's been reviewed, I guess, by the city already at this point. They are working through separate liquor licensing and in close contact with the um, city clerk's office regarding compliance on liquor licensing. So we're not really involved in a lot of that, right. but they have reviewed the site plan and find the site plan as proposed meets the liquor licensing requirements All for right. the improvements. And, and do we have a site plan that shows more than just the improvements, but the uh, existing building? I'm, so I'm curious about the egress, the walking path from the building to to the garden area, and how that's going to work with parking cars is a concern. Right now, um, we have the same plan that was approved for the garden. Um, we have uh, uh, we have dealt with the property that has that plan, and then we have uh, uh, what we have coming up. So we do have crosswalks and the changes um, right there. That Right. Where is that? The gate's going to be roughly. We don't have a laser pointer anymore, huh? Oh, so people have to go walk through the parking lot. Oops. Okay. Okay. Good. Can you check the microphone, Lisa, while you're up there? Is that just tap the microphone? Actually, can I ask you to tap? I want to make sure that my, my, your microphone, just tap it. Yes, sir. Oh, okay, great. Sorry. Okay. Um, so, yeah, so basically right there is going to be um, a gated egress, uh -huh. and right here is the main entrance into um, the garden. Got it. Great. Thank you. Do you have any additional questions? Commissioner? Yeah, I would just share. I guess I'm concerned about the safety of, you know, I want to maintain the jovial and celebratory um, atmosphere, and I guess I'm just concerned about people walking back and forth. It, if I understand that parking lot, it seems like there's a, a few entrances into that parking lot, and, and that entr that pedestrian park pedestrian pathway is close to one of those entrances. Correct. So there are other shops there, and I'm concerned that there's going to be traffic passing by, and of course, maybe people have slower reflexes walking from the beer garden to the restaurant. And <laughs> I mean, and, and I just want to make sure that it's safe. Maybe, I don't know if we should consider lights or something else, some other, some other way to keep it safe so people know that this is a new thing and people are going to be walking back and forth. Uh, uh, Commissioner Howe, that's a very valid concern. Um, right now there are plenty of stanchions for lighting, um, which is the uh, park, parking lot lighting, for lack of a better term, um, that lights that area pretty significantly um, when it's dark. Uh, we will be installing solar lighting. So um, I don't have, an, I, don't, I don't think we plan to bring um, you know, actual um, lighting from Excel in there, but we will do solar lighting. And if there's something that you guys would like us to work on, then absolutely. Um, but is it a, also a concern of ours? Keep making sure. And, and just so you know, that even though we have a self-serve tap wall, there is a limitation. So uh, we cut people off at, I believe, five, a little under five beers, so 68, 70 ounces. Um, and that really enables us to put eyeballs on people and make sure that they're not overindulging. Any additional questions? Yeah, going back to the uh, music question, the live music question, will there be um, just normal amplified music kind of when there's no live band? Uh, I, we, do, we do not plan on, on uh, uh, amplified music out there, no. Okay. Great, seeing no additional questions, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, now we'll open up for public comment. Um, you know, I believe. Yeah, we have no, uh, nobody signed up with a card. We have one person online wanting to speak. Okay, you ready great. Ready for that? Okay, so uh, Mark Cathcart is, uh, has his hand raised, and Mark, I'm allowing you to talk. And Mr. Cathcart, well, you know the drill, name and address, thank you.
Yes, so we are not hearing you yet. There we go. Yes, we can hear you now. So I actually was desperately trying to get you to get to turn your applicant's microphone on. I don't really have a comment on the on the application. I think it's an interesting use of a parking lot. Um, I mean, if they're not proposing putting any shade out there, I personally couldn't see using it. Though. I mean, maybe at night when it's dark, I don't know. But it just seems it seems odd. But I don't really have beyond that. I don't have an application or a comment. It was really just to try and get you to turn their microphone. Thank you. Thank you, and thanks for that report from the field. Um, so I guess then we have no additional people wishing to speak on this issue. Um, we give the applicant a chance for a closing response and statement at this time. If you, and then uh, let's play with the microphone a little bit, try to get you closer to it. Is that, okay, perfect. Yeah, hopefully you'll yeah. be able to hear me now. My apologies. Um, so in terms of shade, uh, the, uh, the PUD amendment um, will have uh, shade sails that will be attached uh, by, a, I believe, four by four posts. So we will uh, engage to make sure that um, those are safe. But uh, for the temporary purpose, we will have um, rather large umbrellas on each of those tables. And right now that we have uh, a plan of 10 tables, um, so there will be um, some, uh, some shade there for people. So. Great. Do we have any last chance questions for the applicant? I'll just note one difference. I know this came up a little bit that um, in most zone districts that you all consider outdoor dining, it's approved through an SRU. This is an allowed use as is, right? So I think there is a little bit of a difference when we consider, you know, some of the impacts. I mean, through these processes, you still have the opportunity to weigh in, but I think some of these are presumed given that this is an allowed use versus a special review use in other areas of the city. Thank you for that clarification. Do you have any, does staff have any closing statement? Nothing further, thank you. Thank you. I will now close the public hearing and the planning commissioners will deliberate on the evidence presented. During deliberations, no further public comment or other testimony or evidence will be received. Who would like to begin? Commissioner Beal. Yeah, um, so I, I am uh, generally supportive uh, of the approach of going to nine months versus the 90 days. Uh, I appreciate the flexibility that the city's and the staff's providing one of our businesses. Uh, I, again, I, I echo uh, some of our citizens' comment that it's a good use of the parking lot, uh, and I look forward to hopefully enjoying your premises someday. So I do think, uh, to echoing Commissioner Howe, we, we might want to consider a condition, which is no music after 10 p.m., Maybe we can work our way down the line, Commissioner Crane. Sure, I, I also find myself generally supportive of it and would, would like to hear more details if anybody wanted to discuss how to um, regulate music and ideas for, um, for making the crosswalk safer as conditions. Um, yeah, I'm also in support. I think it's um, any time, at least from my perspective, we can activate what would have been a parking lot with something that is um, a, a more pedestrian scale. Um, and and uh, I think this, this proposal has been uh, thought out well. I, w I was a little concerned about sort of busyness and Highway 42, but I, I like the concept of placing kind of the, the more active area closer to the road, the busier roadway, and then having kind of a quieter area to the to the west side. And so I think it's a, I, I, I applaud you for coming up with a, a concept like this, and so I'll be in support of it. Great, Commissioner. And just one quick note as we pass me by. Um, the reason we pass me by is so I don't try to like influence the other people on the commission. I do happen to get last comment too at that point in time. I don't know which is better. Um, the other thing, though, is that this is actually an outlot, right? So there are two outlots on this property uh, that may someday be developed, uh, including a drive-through facility. So this is not just a parking lot. Um, and so I think also for that reason, parking in the area is probably not as big of an issue because it's part of it. So please, Commissioner Hefner. Yeah, I don't have a, a whole lot to add. I, I 
seems like a great project. I'm in favor of the, the nine month period. I, I especially agree with Commissioner Moline's comments about activating, um, activating this area. I personally don't see a need to attach conditions to it, um, but I'm happy to entertain reasonable conditions. Yeah, I, I'm in support of this proposal. I think it is a very creative use um, to benefit local businesses and residential needs. And I think it enhances an existing unused DLO building site. Um, and I would support that nine month extension too. Um, I'm not uh, a city planner, but I guess I'm thinking about the pedestrians. I think just trying to keep things safe, either having a light there or signs that say, you know, pedestrian crossing. I I've been in that parking lot before and I'm sure when it's dark and there's kids walking back and forth as, as there are in those shopping centers and there's a pizza place there, um, it can get confusing and we just want to avoid any any accidents. I guess you could have an, where the exit was planned in the southeast corner of the beer garden, you, you could have them exit there and then go down that main sidewalk. But of course, that's not the closest point between A and B. So I understand if you're gonna have it close to that entry of the parking lot, I think maybe good signage and, and, and lighting would really benefit because that is a busy part in that parking lot. But I think this is really a really great solution to an unused area. And regarding the Sound ordinance or sound. So actually, can you clarify um, wh what is c what is what are they governed by at that point? It's the Currently. city's noise ordinance. And for hours, that would include. I will have to pull it up. Okay. All right. Um, what are your current thoughts? I would assume it uh, applies, and they have to comply to the downtown noise ordinances, which I think from previous discussions, maybe last year, it goes until. 9.30 or 10, but I could, I could be corrected there. And I would so be okay you, with that. Are you comfortable with that? I would be comfortable yeah. with that. Okay, great. Uh, with that, then that's okay. And so then I think we're okay with it then, that it is. Um, uh, another comment? Yeah, could we just say that um, the condition is that it complies with the noise ordinance rather than specify a time? We, we don't have to, that's law. Okay. So there, we don't there, have to do that as a condition. So there is no downtown noise ordinance with a specific oh, okay. time. I think we're thinking of what we've applied to SRUs in the past. We've often put a time limit on amplified music or music, and it's usually depending on its proximity to residential um, tends to influence the condition. So there's some consistency, but there's no ordinance. So if you want a condition for 10 o'clock, you would want to recommend that um, be a condition of your permit. Okay. So yeah, thank you. Sorry, I missed that. And when I was looking in here, it's kind of that that line of comment. So um, generally, it's the, the disturbance of the peace section of the code in Chapter Nine, offenses against public peace, and the hours associated with that are midnight to six a.m. But they're also not necessarily. I mean, it, it's more specific and probably written differently than to capture, you know, maybe what your specific concerns are. So if you do feel like um, putting some limitation through this temporary use permit, um, you could do so. Um, you know, alternatively, you could work through this later if, if noise complaints come up, you know, during the temporary operation. So I think you could kind of go in a couple um, different directions here. But you can, you know, given the criteria um, being, you know, not to cause, you know, it's, it's not contrary to the health and general welfare of the surrounding area and that the use is compatible, you certainly could add conditions as part of the temporary use. I would feel comfortable uh, using the nine month trial period to, to see how it goes. Obviously, you guys understand the concern and you do have some residential neighbors, so um, I'd be okay with just moving forward. So uh, although I find myself in favor of it, I propose that the conditions are stated. Uh, and with that, um, I would entertain a motion. I'll, I'll move approval of resolution number 12, series 2022, a resolution recommending approval of a temporary use as a precursor to a permanent use for a nine month period to allow construction of an outdoor beer garden located at 1077 Courtesy Road. Second. Uh, roll call vote, please. Commissioner Hefner. Yes. Commissioner Howe. Yes. Commissioner Deal. 
Yes. Commissioner Krantz? Yes. Commissioner Moline? Yes. Chair Bronis? Yes. Motion carries. Good luck moving forward. Thank you. All right. That will bring us to our next item of business. Um, as we move into that, um, so just to manage expectations a little bit, we will be ending uh, this evening's hearing at roughly 9 o'clock p.m., perhaps a little bit longer if we need to let it run for kind of flow of the meeting. But um, So with that, we'll move into, well, I'm going to read the script again. So I will now open the public hearing on a request for a preliminary and final pat Red Tail Ridge. The purpose of the hearing is to receive evidence regarding the application materials and provide a public forum for all interested parties who wish to comment on this request before the Planning Commission. The procedure for the public hearing will be as follows. First, there will be a presentation and testimony by city staff, followed by questions from the Planning Commission to staff. Next, we will have a presentation and testimony by the applicant, followed by questions from the Planning Commission to the applicant. After these two presentations, members of the public who have joined the meeting in person by computer or telephone may speak regarding the application. If you're here to speak in person, please fill out a white card that's available at the end of the table. Uh, anyone who would like to speak is asked to use the raise hand function if you're participating by computer or star nine if calling in by telephone. Comments are limited to three minutes per person. The purpose of public comment is to receive public testimony and not a forum for debate or dialogue. Commenters are encouraged to raise pertinent issues and may ask questions for clarity. However, these questions will not be directly answered during the public comment period. The applicant and staff will then be allowed to make a closing statement. I will then close the public hearing and no further testimony or other evidence will be received unless the commission decides to reopen the hearing. The planning commission will discuss the matter and may approve, approve with conditions, deny or continue to a future meeting. Public hearings are recorded for the public record. All testimony must be presented after stating your full name and address. Does anyone participating in this hearing object to the procedure I've described? Seeing none, uh, do we have proper notification? Uh, yes, we do. This was published in the Boulder Daily Camera Sunday, July 24th, uh, posted on the property, uh, posted at city facilities, and mailed notices on or before July 27th. Thank you. And I believe we have a couple of disclosures. If we can begin with Commissioner Hefner. Yeah, I'm uh, going to accuse myself and not participate in this uh, part of the discussion, and I'm going to excuse myself from the meeting and see you all in a month. Oh, excellent. Thank Thanks. you very much. And Commissioner Krantz, I believe. Yeah, as, as some of you already may already be aware, I participated in the referendum election for the general development plan amendment, including signing the petition, having discussions with others, and voting at the election. Um, but the plat application before us tonight is a separate quasi-judicial matter, which I have not prejudged. And as a member of this commission, I will base my decision only on the evidence presented to us during this public hearing and based on the criteria in the city code and other applicable um, requirements. So I'm committed to being fair and impartial decision maker and doing my part to ensure that the applicant gets a fair um, hearing. Thank you very much. Very much appreciate that. Commissioner Moline. Uh, I'm just going to disclose that I'm an employee of Boulder County Parks and Open Space and the, that department is involved in um, some discussions about open space that is outside the um, it, it, it's within the staff report, but outside of our area of interest here this evening. Just wanted to make that disclosure. Thank you very much. All right. No disclosures from the remainder of us. Excellent. Uh, with that, then, I'd invite you for a staff presentation. All right. Well, um, good evening, Chair Bronice, members of the commission. I'm Rob Zucchero. I'm the Director of Planning and Building Safety for the City. I'll be making the presentation this evening. I do want to note that City Attorney Kelly is on the line uh, this evening, as um, you did speak with her earlier, but she is here and available for any questions regarding this case. Um, so what's before us this evening is um, a proposal for a preliminary and final subdivision plat for Red Tail Ridge filing number one. That's the proposed name of the plat. And this is the property. So we, you, you did review a land use case on this, as you all know, last year. So I'm going to go a little bit into the background again before I get into the 
content of the application. Uh, but as, as you all know, I believe this is the former storage tech property. This is an image of when storage tech was actually operating on this property. It's a 390 acre property within city of Louisville. Um, it's bound, um, let me get the, the pointer here. I'll try over here. It's bound by city and county of Broomfield on the south and east side, uh, town of Superior on the other side of US 36, uh, the unincorporated Boulder County in this area here. You could also see it's adjacent to a series of open space, the Bose and Admar open spaces. Hey, Rob, sorry, to, can we maybe use a laser pointer over here to help Bet, him? Absolutely, so sorry about can, that. So we can all, yep. yes, <laughs> that might help. All Thank right. you. Um, and let's see, we've got the Vista Campus, the Monarch uh, K through 12 campus as well. So that's kind of the context of where this property is at. Um, I do wanna note too that we've got Northwest Parkway and 95th Street here as well. So in around 2009, uh, Conoco Phillips purchased the property and they were planning a research campus on the property. Uh, they did demolish the former storage tech campus. So this is an image, a more recent image after the campus was demolished. So this is very similar to what this is today. Uh, back in 2010, Conoco Phillips approached the city. Um, they, um, they rezoned the property to plan community zone district commercial. So that happened in 2010. And as you know, when there's a rezoning to our plan community zone district zoning category, it requires a general development plan. So there was a general development plan approved in 2010, and there was a zoning agreement or a development agreement included with that. There was also a preliminary PUD and preliminary plat proposed for that development. The general development plan and the zoning agreement um, they, those are permanent zoning approvals. They run with the land, they're recorded on the property. Um, the applicant is proposing to develop under those 2010 approvals. The preliminary PUD and preliminary plat from 2010, which was for the development of the ConocoPhillips campus, those are expired. But again, the general development plan and the zoning agreement are, are current. Um, this is an image up here, and I know you can't read it, of the general development plan. It's a one-page zoning document. Some of our general development plans are multiple pages. This one happened to be one page. Um, and it shows a, a general road layout of the property. <coughs> Sorry, I'm gonna point up here. It's, it's um, a general road layout of the property. There are some general notes that indicate that a minimum 12% public land dedication requirement is needed, which matches our ordinance. And I'll talk much more about that later. It notes that the, it, all development has to comply with the commercial design standards of the city. Uh, there is a, a FAR maximum or a density maximum, which equals approximately 2.6 million square feet of development cap for the property. Uh, there are, uh, there's a list of allowed uses and parking requirements. There is a general commercial allowance, which references to a zoning ordinance list that's pretty broad of allowed commercial uses on the property. And then there are setback requirements. There's also a note here that addresses height. Within our zoning ordinance, a general development plan has to be generally consistent with the underlying zoning standards for bulk and setback. This is the PUD that was approved, but again has expired, and that was specific to ConocoPhillips. So what's before you this evening, again, is a, a combined application for a preliminary and final subdivision plat. And the subdivision plat worried people won't be able to hear us because that, that happened previously if you get too far away. I'm trying to find the sweet spot. 
Um, so a subdivision plat generally establishes lots, blocks, tracts of land for development. Um, this is where develop, uh, the development will dedicate a lot of those to uh, the development easement. It's usually the city, sometimes other utilities and other entities that are needed for the development. Um, there is a public land dedication requirement, which is a big part of our subdivision process as well for new development. And then there's a subdivision improvement agreement for all the public infrastructure that needs to go in there. So that's all part of the application. Uh, there is a proposed staging of the application. There's the first phase. And there's, there's a red outline that shows the first phase of development. It includes, let me get this one here. It kind of includes most of the eastern part of the property, but it also includes all of campus drive all of the trail infrastructure and network that's being proposed. Really what it excludes is the extension of this road here, and I'll talk in more detail about the road in a bit. Uh, future phases of what's being proposed would be the, the com completion of this road, which is called Rock Club Drive. Um, there are some drainage improvements that would be in those future phases. Fuel plant expansion, which would be further into the road system again. So I'm going to review the public land dedication proposal. Um, and bef before I get into that, so I do want to mention there is a series of lots and blocks. And within their first phase of development, it's not obvious in the plat, but I, I, as I understand it, they, they are platting some of the lots on these sides for development at an earlier date. Even though they're calling them lots and blocks in those what would be the future phases, um, you know, those could be really large campus users. We don't know. Um, they could be further subdivided in the future. I think the way they're subdividing the property right now, though, they are platting lots, so we also assume that there could be development. So the subdivision agreement would, we will need provisions in the subdivision agreement because these are being platted as actual lots that state that that road infrastructure is going to go in there and it's going to be built in for development. So that's just a little bit more on the phases. So public land dedication, again, our code requires a minimum of 12% for commercial properties. This could be any public purpose. Uh, it could be schools, parks, it could be a fire station, it could be a library. It's, it's most often open space um, in the city. It's where most development is done, so that's the minimum. When we, look, when we look at previous developments that have come through the city, um, most dedicate more than 12%. Um, there's really a wide range of what people actually end up dedicating. Um, in this case, there of the 390 acres, there is an 80 acre area of this property that's exempt from the public land dedication. So that was agreed to through a previous annexation agreement. So when you apply that 12% to the remainder of the property, their minimum requirement is 37.1 acres of public land dedication. Um, they are proposing 155.3 acres of public land. Now that includes both within and outside of the development. So a lot of that public land dedication is being proposed as open space and they're within separate tracks. The applicant during the public review process with OSAB actually amended their proposal. And in addition to these open space tracks and this park tract, and there's a public safety tract and some trail corridor tracks, they added another 18 acre tract of land on the southern side of the property and then 47.4 acres in Boulder County outside of the boundaries of the plat. But all total, it's 155 acres. Just as a little historical context, when ConocoPhillips actually proposed, and again, this is an expired plan, but when ConocoPhillips um, proposed their PUD, they were further defining their public land dedication. They actually were proposing dedicating this 20 acres, the southern part of this 47, as part of their public land dedication requirement. Um, I, I will say that um, staff, I don't have a slide on this, but as because this was a recent addition to the public land dedication request, the 47.4 acres and then the 18 acre tract, um, staff has had a lot of discussions. We've started discussions with Boulder County 
about dedication of the Paradise Lane properties, and those are positive. I think the city and the county are very supportive of including those in the public land dedication. Staff has evaluated this 18-acre tract down here. We do think it's a valuable buffer tract. Um, the city does not want to take ownership and maintenance of that tract, so in the staff report, I explained that the city is actually going to recommend that this 18 acres be what we call common open space and private common open space. So there's a designation in the zoning code that outlines um, what it defines, what private common open space is. It has to be maintained in a natural way, but it is usually, it is usually owned privately. We recommend that the Metro District actually take ownership and then we would write maintenance provisions and potentially um, we're still working through some of it about whether, um, you know, if there is gonna be public um, access, if there's ever trails or amenities in there, perhaps we wanna make sure there's public access as well. So that's staff's recommendation on that section of land. Um, our Open Space Advisory Board and Parks and Public Landscaping Advisory Board did review the public land dedication proposal and they are recommending approval um, in its current configuration. Um, the, the, the Parks Board, you know, didn't see the additions of the other open spaces, but they were comfortable with the parkland dedication. City doesn't, the developer would not be developing that parkland. It would be held for future use and development by the city, perhaps for ball fields or whatever the city determines the need is out there. So I'm going to go into the road and trail plan next. Um, this first filing of the plat um, would set um, an expectation of campus drive. So right now, campus drive dead ends at the end of the campus. And very importantly, this proposal would extend campus drive all the way to 96th Street. That's actually in that 2010 zoning agreement, that whatever development takes place on this property in the first phase, you have to extend campus drive. That's gonna relieve congestion for the school as well as improve safety and emergency access to the school. So that's a really important part of any development that takes place on the property in the first phase. Um, there is an old private road that's generally in this area here. Um, they're proposing to do a little bit of realignment and rebuild that road as Rockcrest Drive. And then there's a Northwest connector of Sorrel Avenue. In future filings or future phases of this development, it's likely there'll be additional roads platted or they may be private roads as well, but we'll, that's something to consider in the future. But we've, the traffic analysis all just considers this, spot, this primary spine road network. Um, all of the roads, we did work really closely with the applicant on our transportation master plan policies for roadways and having um, facilities for all ages and all abilities on those roads. So we do have um, all of the road networks have on-street bike lanes, buffered, striped buffered lanes, as well as off-street sidewalks and, um, and uh, trails. Uh, within the street cross sections. They vary in width, but we, we did have, we did think a lot about school routes and the, the widest um, off street trails are along the south side of Campus Drive, um, really enhancing school routes. There are all also um, soft surface and hard surface trails throughout the development that are included within the city's open spaces that are being dedicated as well as along the east and south side of the property. Um, there's some trail connections here. I think of note is there's a trail connection between the US 36 trail here um, that would connect down to an existing underpass and connecting to the Rock Creek Trail. So there'd be a trail connection there. Um, there are two underpasses being proposed under Campus Drive as part of that trail network. And then there is um, some consideration, although there's no final plans of a potential north south trail through this area up through the open spaces. That's not part of this project, but this would, uh, this would create a link if the city and the county ever did want to connect um, a trail north that could go all the way to Coal Creek. Uh, it would have to cross Dillon Road um, and this following a potential ditch alignment. So those are potential future projects. 
So within those street right-of-ways, um, there are roundabouts at the major intersections. Is the traffic control that's being proposed? Uh, we have landscape plans that are under review. Our, what we are expecting would be in the subdivision agreement and agreements with the Metro District is that the right-of-way landscaping, even though it would be publicly dedicated and within public right-of-way, the Metro District would irrigate and take care of the landscaping. The city would take care of all of the trails and the hardscapes within the right-of-way within the development. Uh, the, so we did get a, an updated traffic analysis. So as you know, there was an application last year for a GDP amendment that um, you know, was not ultimately supported by the community. Um, but there was a traffic study that assumed the proposal, which was about 3 million square feet of development. So the applicant used that traffic study and amended the land uses and the development caps. Um, and revise the study. So within your packet, you actually have the study from last year, and then you have a traffic analysis memo that updates the technical analysis. This showed that they went down from about 3 million square feet to 2.6 million square feet, and they changed the use assumptions. And um, I think it's on the next slide. So there's a lot of data here. And I tried to zoom in as much, but I'm just going to just look down at the bottom here. Um, what it's showing, so this is average weekday trips. And down here at full build out, it's a, a, over 20,000 average weekday trips. This 641, this compares it to the red tail GDP proposal that had more square footage, but different uses. They've reduced the square footage. The reason it's going, it's still going up, you're still getting more trips is the assumptions in the land use. They've added the hospital and medical offices and made some other adjustments to the intended uses, which are all allowed under the GDP. They're all allowed uses. Um, so when you model that, you're getting a slight increase over what was anticipated last year. And then we have weekend, uh, I'm sorry, AM and PM peak hour. And you do see a, um, a slight increase in the totals um, within those time frames as well. So that's part of the update. Um, this is trip distribution. This is working with the applicant's traffic engineer on how much traffic, per, uh, proportions of traffic coming in and out of the site. So um, you know, much of the traffic is anticipated to come off of US 36, Northwest Parkway, and 96th Street with a lesser proportion coming off of McCaslin and Dillon from the west in 88. So those are all assumptions built into the traffic study. <clears throat> no, we assumed the same distribution numbers. So part of the, so of course they'd be building all the infrastructure within the development, but the proposal also includes some offsite infrastructure. So this is from the traffic study and it summarizes some of the offsite improvements. So there are some road capacity improvements that the traffic study recommends and these would be in the this these would be in the subdivision improvement agreement that they would have to build certain roadway capacity improvements. Um, north of Dillon Road um, Sorry, I'm 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 not remembering the exact point where it transitions, but the as it was last year with the GDP amendment, um, where the, uh, the subdivision improvement agreement is going to state that the applicant has to build all of the offsite improvements, there is a there is a point where they just have to give a proportional cost uh, up north of Dillon Road. Um, but as far as improvements at Campus Drive in '96, Campus Drive in Northwest Parkway, um, they would be building those capacity improvements. Um, as well as the Rockcrest Drive connection with Via Vara. There's some uh, transportation improvements that go into the Broomfield Northwest Parkway right of way that they would be constructing as part of their public improvements. Um, the traffic study notes that the US 36 interchange and uh, Northwest Parkway in future years will not function at adequate levels of service. Um, but there are no plans in place, you know, that the applicant can't propose, um, you know, s 
small capacity improvements. Those have, those are big design. Um, those are going to be bigger designs that have to happen with multi jurisdictions to figure out what those are going to be in future years. So we really didn't focus on you know any big capacity improvements that would come from this development. But we do note that without improvements, there will be level of service issues within those sections of road. And just to clarify again while we have it up. Um, regarding the who pays for what when kind mm -hmm. of issues, right? So the applicant doesn't have to deal with the US 36 improvements, right? No, we're not anticipating that right now. Yeah, those would be, uh, that's just a separate project, but we do, this development would add quite a bit of traffic to the interchange. And with or without this development, the traffic study is noting that the interchange will start to have a level of service of F in the future. This will yeah, make it happen faster. Right. Um, so there will need to be some effort uh, in the future to make improvements to that intersection. Thanks. Would you mind just clarifying the dates on that? Um, like there are 2040 yeah. when it would originally be changed, and with the development, was there a projection? Um, so the traffic study, I believe, suggests that the interchange. Um, would need to be updated in the 2027 to 2028 timeframe. And that capacity of Northwest Parkway would need to be addressed within the 2030 to 2035 timeframe. And again, that's, that's due to all traffic, both regional traffic increases and increases from this development. Um, there is some off-site right-of-way requirements with this development. Um, Northwest Parkway Authority um, would need to provide some right-of-way for some of the capacity, off-site capacity improvements. North Metro Fire Rescue, um, which owns a station uh, here. This, this is the Northwest Parkway 96th Street intersection. Um, Campus Drive would be coming in about this location. So there's some right-of-way needs um, that would be conditions of this plat being recorded, ultimately, that they would have to provide this right-of-way and a subdivision agreement to build this. Um, Boulder Valley School District, this is the road section uh, for Campus Drive. Um, about two years ago, when we were working on the original GDPs, the school, and it had this, really the same road cross-section, the school district provided a resolution of support it's expired, so that does need to go back through the school district process just to verify um, that they are still in support of the right of way. Uh, but th they were, in our discussions, they're supportive of the design. The 2010 zoning agreement requires a transportation demand management plan. So that's a plan that gets put in place to try to support multimodal trips, reduce single occupancy vehicles, support other modes of transportation. Um, there is some information um, that, you know, is a carryover from the GDP that's supplemented with a commitment letter from the applicant, but staff is making a recommendation that we get a more formal plan um, in place before this goes to city council. But our understand, um, what we've been talking to the applicant about is having the Metro District um, actually fund and operate a transportation demand management program, and um, they, can, they can speak to it when they speak, but our understanding is that the, um, they are agreeable to that. We just need to work on some agreements on that. Um, they could provide eco-passes, hire a TDM coordinator that could run carpool programs and put out information to um, you know, employers within the development. Uh, there's a potential for local shuttles. We don't have localized RTD service, and so uh, private shuttles could be an option. Uh, bicycle commute amenities, those are the types of things that go into transportation demand management plans. Um, you can see, you know, City of Louisville compared to Boulder County, um, you know, we're a little behind as far as single occupancy vehicles. We have quite a bit more. Um, than the county as a whole. So um, anything we can do to try to relieve congestion through transportation demand management would be a good thing. Um, this uh, preliminary final plat includes final drainage plans, shows all of the regional detention ponds 
for the development. Um, and, um, you know, there are plans for storm sewer, wastewater, new water lines for the development. All of the infrastructure for storage tech is really outdated and needs to be replaced, so it's all new infrastructure. There, there will need to be a sewer lift station down in the southeast part of the property. Um, that would have to come in in the first phase as well. Um, the wastewater treatment plant will require expansion at some point in the future. So within the subdivision agreement, we're working on what's going to trigger that. And so we're going to have to track development over. They may put it in early, and it won't be an issue. But um, if they don't get it in, we do need to track development over time and make sure capacity remains. Uh, OK, so I'm getting to the end here, finally. <laughs> Approval, but I did want to go through. There's just a lot of detail. Um, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time actually on the approval criteria. We provided within the staff memo um, quite a bit of detail. And again, these are just recommend these are staff's recommended findings. This is to help start the discussion. Certainly, the commission um, absolutely should and will make up their own findings and determinations on all the criteria. But we pointed out that within the code, there's these three criteria, and I'll just go through. The first one is whether the plat conforms to all of the requirements of the title. That's the first one. And that when we say the title, that's the subdivision code. So there's a lot of technical stuff in there. I just note that all of the city departments, the police department, the fire district, they've all reviewed it. There are a series of conditions. There's some public works conditions that are largely technical in the memo. Um, but with the conditions, we find that it is complying with the relevant sections of the, ti of the subdivision's title of our code. The next is whether the plat is consistent with the comprehensive plan and applicable zoning requirements. Um, the comprehensive plan calls out this property as a rural district. It's the Phillips 66 rural district. There are density policies and other things. Um, and really, because the plat isn't like a PUD, it's just setting the development parcels. Um, there's some level of analysis we could do on this, but we'll, this is a lot of this will be applicable at the PUD level, perhaps more than the plat. But we do believe that the parcels generally are being set consistent with the GDP, consistent with zoning, um, consistent with comprehensive plan policy. Um, there, there is information about height in there. Again, we, we're not dictating height on the plat. That would all get dictated through the BUT. Um, sorry, PUD process. Okay, so the num so number three is whether the proposed subdivision will promote the purposes set forth in section 16.420 and with the design standards in 16.16. So 16.420 has 19 purpose statements, I guess I'll call them, and um, staff did provide a little bit of analysis on each of those 19 statements um, to, you know, to give our opinion on compliance. And then within the design standard, there are six different sections of design standards that you can see up here. There's general, there's streets, blocks, lots, public sites and dedications that we already talked about. Um, street, uh, we already talked about that, streets and alleys and site considerations. Um, I, there is, so within a subdivision too, you can modify standards. There's a modifications section. Staff notes that there is a maximum and minimum block standard. And they have these super blocks that exceed the maximum standards. So you would have to grant a modification to that standard um, as part of this approval if, if you are recommending approval. So we note that in the staff report. Um, I did not put that in the resolution, so um, it, you know, if you are working on a resolution this evening, I just want to make sure perhaps that gets added to the resolution to recognize that modification. Uh, again, the Parks and Public Landscaping Board, Open Space Advisory Board reviewed this. The Open Space Board had four conditions of their approval. None of them actually had to do with the configuration of public land dedication, but I note them here. Um, they wanted to make sure that you know, we're having appropriate legal commitments on that, those, four, those 47 acres of Paradise Lane properties. Um, there's standards for the underpass design. So it base, generally follows the standards 
of, let's say, the McCaslin underpass that includes core 10 steel railings and nice stonework and um, you know the city logo. So we have a condition in your resolution on that. Um, OSA, that o, they, OSAP can participate in PUD reviews, which our ordinance already says they do if there's any, um, if it's adjacent to or has any implications for open space. And then they did ask about consideration of a third underpass with this trail alignment. Um, they didn't say that there was conditional on it. They basically asked the applicant to consider whether um, it would, just to consider it, I guess. And so I did ask, talk to the applicant, and they can talk to that. And they, they do not want to pursue that at this time. Um, and they can talk more to that. Um, so staff is recommending approval. Um, we have a series of conditions. Um, I'm not going to go over them all, but I, I did tract L. That's the 18 acres up on the south side. It kind of covers that big berm, if you're familiar with it. It covers a lot of the berm. We forgot to add a condition about labeling tract L on the plat as common open space. So in the memo in your resolution, we forgot to add that. So I added it here. We do talk about tract L in the SIA, but I forgot to add it for the rest. Okay, so thank you for indulging the very long presentation, uh, and I'd be happy to answer any questions or if you want to go to the applicant presentation next. Well, thank you very much for the presentation. I think we'll take maybe five minutes, and then we can uh, come back with questions for Director Zakara.
Great, if we can reconvene then. So, Commissioner, questions for Director Zaccaro. Who would like to, why don't we start at the far end? Well, I'll start, I have a, a lot of questions for the, regarding this, but maybe I'll just start with one or two and then pass it down the line. Maybe we have similar questions. Uh, I think one of the concerns from the public comments um, and looking at the greater view here is, it, it, I'm sure there's a lot of changes, but if you could highlight some of the changes from the previous repealed ordinance to this one, there was some concern is that they were the same. Would you be able to do that? And, and then maybe comment on the land use. Uh, I don't know if you can go in, in, in any detail about that, but you did mention that there is some hospitals and other things. Uh, according yeah. to block, uh, has there been thoughts about block use, uh, land use? Yeah. Um so let me start by trying to summarize a little bit of the difference between this plan and the ordinance that was overturned last year. Um, let me just, I know you can't really see this, but, I, and I know you, you know, you all reviewed the GDP from last year. It was, you know, it was, it was a lot of different pages and it had a lot of details. So this plan is a lot more simple um, in its content. And, um, not only that, but when it, the plan from last year went through city council, there was a lot of conditions included on it. Um, the land use plan on last year's plan was much more specific. It had a lot of really specific uses. Um, so we worked with the applicant a lot to, to really try to define that so everybody understood what could be built there. Um, I think th even though this was intended for the campus use, of ConocoPhillips, ultimately, the way the language was written, it actually supports a really broad contingent of commercial uses, and that's just an effect of the way it's written. It does talk about commercial uses without limitation in there, which takes us back to our, within that, this zone district, there's a list of allowed commercial uses. So that includes hospitals, it includes, um, you know, you know, really the what you would expect is a broad use of office and retail. There is language in this table that's very specific to light industrial uses too that we would see in the Colorado Tech Center. Um, that was in the old plan too. The old plan um, had a lot of detail. It had a lot of detail. It had what we call the sustainability commitment plan. So, you know, the 2010 plan doesn't have a sustainability commitment plan. Um, the to, um, this plan does not have a commitment for LEED certified building. It doesn't have a commitment for um, solar on the property. That was a formal part of the approval from last year. Last year's approval um, that was overturned allowed approximately 3 million square feet of development. This one allows um, in the range of 2.5 to 2.6 uh, million square feet of development. Um, the, the plan from last year also had less, slightly less open space, especially with the amendments they've recently made, slightly, um, it had less public land dedication. Um, we were also working on that general development plan had a concept of private common open space that would be in exchange for um, height waivers. And so, you know, we worked a lot on this, um, this concept um, of clustering buildings. And if you clustered buildings, then you could have more height. So that general development plan is a way to kind of master plan those types of things. So I think I've hit a lot of those, and what was your second question? I'm sorry. You had mentioned hospitals and light industrial use. Mm -hmm. Are you comfortable sharing what blocks would have those, yeah, what gonna, the land use is gonna be? I, yeah. I know that that's probably putting yeah. the cart before so, the horse. Well, yeah, I'll let the, the applicant really clarify. I, I do know there is a public graphic in there that um, it, within the traffic analysis that shows the hospital uses on the east side. Um, so I, I'll just invite the applicant to clarify you know, what they can share about, about that. And, and I'll just let other people ask questions. I'm sure mine will be answered in the oh, process. Yeah. Commissioner Deal. Great, thanks Rob. So with the current proposal, 
Um, does the proposal, it maximizes the FAR or the total developable uh, property? So right now, because it's just a subdivision plat, um, it's not really addressing how much development will ultimately go on the property. That's just the cap that's on that 2010 okay. GDP. Okay. And for clarity's sake, um, the 155 acre uh, open space dedication, to that, that does or does not include the 80 acres that was exempt? So the, I would say the, when we calculate the minimum required at this 37, we're exempting the 80 acres. But um, that 155 acres, that's just how much public land they're proposing to dedicate overall. So it really is independent of the exemption. Okay, I guess what I'm getting at is, is, the, is the 155 that's being dedicated, did they have, does that include the 80 that they kind of had to do anyway? No, I'm, yeah, let, let, me, let me clarify that. So okay. th there was an 80 acre section of the property that was annexed and it was exempt from the public land dedication. I see. But it doesn't mean that it was designated as public land. It was actually, it was never designated as public land as part of that annexation. So, and I guess what I'm trying to get to is it's, they were, they were minimum required was 37 and they're proposing 155. So it's 4X about. I will just note, cause I forgot it in the presentation, this open space buffer here is actually meeting a requirement of another IGA. So we talked about that a lot with the general development plan oh. proposal from last year. Yeah, let me point to that a little better. This open space here, um, there, there is a IGA, different IGA um, with Boulder County that says that there has to be a development buffer in this portion of the property. And so part of this open space and bringing Campus Drive to the south is meeting the intent of that IGA for that buffer. Okay. Yeah, I mean, and you can see that what the point I'm trying to get to is they've exceeded what by by significant amount what they're required to to dedicate. Yeah. Okay. Um, can you talk about the mineral rights in terms of where who who owns those? And some there were some public uh, questions about potential extraction. Yeah, there there is a. Um I do not know. I'm going to defer to the applicant on ownership of mineral rights. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'll allow, allow others to ask questions. Thanks. Uh, actually, one question. We've been kind of back and forth between the last one and this one on the whole height. So because the previous GDP includes that 95-foot height at four stories, and just kind of really quickly there, the reason that was was because uh, ConocoPhillips wanted to have a research laboratory on petroleum products that were going to include laboratories that had 20-foot ceilings in them was part of it. Um, so, but that's part of the existing GDP. How, how do we kind of so, mesh that with reality now? Right. So if you read that note on the GDP, and you'll never read it on here, but I'll show you where to find it if you want to pull that document up. It's... It's this note right here. It, it talks about anticipated height, but it very clear, clearly states that this GDP does not authorize that height, that it can only be authorized through a PUD application. So I think from, you know, I, I, I think the applicant can, you know, when the applicant develops the property over time, they may want to seek more than three stories and the 35 feet allowed in the CDDSG. But, um, you know, I don't know that this would be a good note to guide that, I think it would probably be more on its own merits, knowing the history of why that note was created. Great, thank you. Commissioner Moline. Hi, Rob, um, I have some questions kind of around grading. Um, when I was looking at the grading plan, the some of the fill slopes on some of the roads are, are quite extensive. Um, and, and maybe this is a question better for the applicant and the applicant team. I'm, I'm just curious, yeah. Yes, yes, so um, it, it do, we do have a maximum slope requirement, mm -hmm. um, and so it does meet that, but it is just meeting it, and that's the slope that we consider is, you know, not too steep to maintain. 
Um, and then the app, and you know, th in order to get the road grading um, to, and I'll let the applicant okay. talk in more detail, but um, there are a lot of big slopes. Yes. <laughs> you know, just to get the road grading to work and get the development sites um, relatively flat. But I'll let them explain more <laughs> on the okay. reasoning for that. That sounds good, Director Zakam. Um, and then maybe just a, another thing, kind of uh, grading, drainage related. Um, looking at the cost uh, and the list of storm drainage improvements and just kind of subdivision improvements, I didn't see the underpasses. I'm wondering if that was because they are also the storm drainage uh, facilities. Okay. Yeah, they will um, be dual okay. culverts and underpasses. Okay. okay. So they are captured in that kind of, uh, again, I couldn't tell you exactly where that was yeah, and which appendix, which appendix, but um, just kind of a listing of all the the uh, facilities and improvements, street yeah, improvements. Yeah, I'm not sure yeah. exactly. I mean, we do have cost estimates for all, all the ma major subdivision improvements. Yeah. They, they, they do need to be included. I don't know exactly where they are, but construction of those. We do have construction plans that our public works department is reviewing. Okay. They clearly show, they, they need to be updated with the design standards that we talked about, but the okay. underpasses are included in the construction documents. Great, okay, thank you. Commissioner Kurtz. Yeah, um, I do have a lot of questions, but I think I just wanted to back up to one, like a big broad question um, in, the in their analysis about whether or not the um, the subdivision plat conforms to this ConocoPhillips GDP. And so I wanted to ask um, if um, you can give us some more context around this. And I want, specifically, um, you said that um, the ConocoPhillips GD, campus GDP and the zoning agreement don't expire and run with the land. But um, when I actually, I wanted you to pull up the actual code that says this, it's um, section 1772.160, because I feel like if we actually read the wording of the code, it um, emphasizes limitations a little bit more than emphasizing the entitlements. And maybe as we give them a minute to do that. Yeah. I, I think and after we discuss some of these issues, we'll just kind of start back down at the far end again if we have additional questions for staff so just going to warn you if you got more we'll we'll get there yeah. um, can you give me that number again? oh sure it's 17.72.160 and the reason i'm asking is because i think we really threw out the as we go through your analysis of all the different points i think we need to keep in mind whether or not um we need a gdp amendment and whether or not this complies with the uh, um, the subdivision plat before us complies with the ConocoPhillips GDP. So I just thought it was important to remind ourselves of this code section. If you want, I can just read what it says or you're finding it there. 17.72.160. Yeah, so I, I have it up. If okay. the commission wants me to read it, I can read it. And if there's a, I don't know if you have a, a specific question about it, I could try to answer. Yeah, I just thought it was important to note the limitations of the ConocoPhillips GDP that would be implied from this code section. Sure, I'll, I'll read it. It says, Section 17.72.160, effect of registered and recorded plans. All final plans registered and recorded or filed hereunder shall be binding upon the applicants, therefore, their successors and assigns shall limit and control the issuance and validity of all building permits and shall restrict and limit the construction, location, use, and operation of all land and structures included within such plans to all conditions and limitations set forth in such plans. So that's what it states. And then, you know, that one page document, it, that is the GDP. And so when, when staff was analyzing it, um, you know, are the, because this is a subdivision plat, so they do have this zoning entitlement of the GDP. So the, the subdivision plat, does it match, it, you know, it, it matches the general anticipated road network. Um, the lots are being subdivided within some phases, but, you know, even if 
within the super blocks that would facilitate the anticipated potential development noted in the GDP. So we felt that the plat does support the standards of the GDP from that standpoint. They're creating lots where development could take place that would match the restrictions of the GDP. So that's staff's thinking on it. Yeah, I guess um, my main question is, I think that we're, can we look at what, I would like us to look at, it might take a little while, but to look at what the actual limitations and restrictions are in the GDP. And um, I don't know if that's something we want to do now or say for other parts of the discussion, but I just wanted to jump into that in the beginning. Um, there's several um, sections of our city code that um, require certain things of a GDP. And I wanted to, uh, maybe as we go along, I wanted to verify conformance with this. I mean, have, you mentioned the, 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 the development the FAR as one mm -hmm. limitation, but what other limitations do you see in this GDP? Sure, so. We have the city attorney online if. Yeah, she, I, I mean, if, if she wants to weigh in, I think I could answer the question, but um, city attorney Kelly could weigh in if there's something I'm missing. But the restrictions on the GDP are that there is the FAR, there's the CDDSG requirement. They have to comply with the commercial design standards. This table limits uses and parking. There are some additional notes that they may have to comply with, with different types of uses. Um, and then there are setbacks, uh, building setbacks. Um, that is, those are the, uh, you know, the restrictions. If you look at the GDP map itself, um, you know, we would expect that the general spine roadway network be consistent um, with the GDP as well. Um, so those are the restrictions that I am aware of on the document. Thank you. Okay. Do you have an additional question? I'm happy to take turns. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Start back down there. Uh, I want to go back to uh, and expand on my question about land use. Uh, Rob, if you could entertain that. Um, so y you had mentioned the yard and bulk requirements, that small paragraph. Mm -hmm. and, and I, pardon my eyesight, but I would just want to read that. Um, it says, building heights are expected to range, and, and this was a big discussion item on the previous proposal, so that's why I wanted to spend a little bit of time on this. If we recall, we were talking about where certain heights of the building should be um, in regards to uh, block numbers, and, and there was a big discussion about that. So in that paragraph you stated, it says yard and bulk requirements. It says building heights are expected to range from 35 feet in some areas to 65 feet in others. Um, proposed minimum building heights in excess of coding requirements will require city council approval. But I think, I think that assumes that if it goes up to 65 feet, it does not require city council approval. Am I reading that correctly? Yeah, I, I think it's actually saying, and maybe, um, at least I don't know if you could bring the GDP up and maybe do the click share. Yeah, but and we can actually zoom in into that language. Um, but I think it's actually saying that you can't go, so our, the CDDSG limits building heights to 35, 35 feet. feet. The only way you can go above 35 feet is to get a waiver through a PUD process. So I read this note to say, um, you know, there, there, you can't get, it's acknowledging you can't get a height waiver through this document. That has to happen through the PUD process, only through the PUD process. Um, again, I would say that this develop, you know, future developers of this property and this developer may want to request height waivers through their PUD processes, but again, because this that was written specifically for that campus, they'll probably have to, you know, use their, argue their own merits. The comprehensive plan, but also backs the concept, though, of if you cluster buildings, that's a good reason to allow additional Higher. height. So if a future applicant comes with the PUD application and demonstrates their clustering buildings and being conscious of view corridors to meet the comp plan policy, they can make their best argument for a height waiver at that time. 
And has there been any discussion going back to this land use idea and where certain buildings are being planned for certain blocks? Is there a certain thought about making the larger heights or higher heights of buildings in the middle on the periphery? That's a great. Or we've not got. Maybe yeah. that's a question for. Yeah, and, yeah, applicant. that's a question for them because because we are outside of the because this is just a plat. It's creating the platted lots. We typically do those types of things through GDPs, and that we're we're just we're we're developing under that 2010 GDP. And then I'll maybe ask one more question, then pass pass it on. <laughs> this could be a. A mur murky question here, but regarding the sewer plant expansion and lift station, um, this is a, a one mile lift station. Is that that seems like a long way for sewer lift for me? Can you comment on that and what engineers is that is that a common thing? It seems like a lot. <laughs> yeah, that's a lot a good of lift question. for a lot of um, I, sewer. Yeah, I'll let their engineer. Yeah, they've got engineering staff here tonight. I'll let them talk to that the length of that run. I, I'm pretty sure there was a lift station there um, for storage tech, though. Um, probably of a very different capacity, and it's. Um, but I'll I'll let them talk to that. Okay, uh, my question is just around some of the finances. And um, typically, I think maybe more in the GDP phase, we would see you know consultants put together financial models and show that you know the development will pay for itself in terms of operating expense, et cetera. Um, and I did see the 27 million estimate for total capex for roads and um, you know sewer and all, all the other investments that need to be made. My question is, is do we have a level of comfort or do, do we know if that's not enough, not necessarily on the CapEx, but if the operating expense can't be covered by the, you know, the development, is there a chance the city would have to uh, cover some of those costs? So let me clarify, are you talking about the initial construction of the public improvements? Um, more so the operating expense after it's built. Right. Um, so, yeah, so the applicant is responsible for building everything. That's in the subdivision agreement. They have to give a financial guarantee and all of that and um, finance that. Um, usually when we do zone changes and we, when we did the GDP amendment, we did what we call our fiscal analysis. So that analyzes what types of revenues the cities would re city would re expect from things like property tax and use tax and sales tax with the development. Um, and then how that goes into different funds and what it would cost the city to maintain the development, um, you know, the infrastructure within the development. Um, we didn't include that in this packet because it's, it's, it's a plat and it's not a rezoning or a GDP. Um, the Parks Board asked for some additional analysis on that, so we just adjusted the numbers and the uses down to the 26 um, 2.6 million square foot cap and used similar land uses. Um, and so it's, it's not a real fine tool, but generally that, you know, we would expect through property tax and use tax and sales tax that there would be adequate revenue to maintain the roads and the trails. Um, we even modeled construction of the park because that's, um, you know, that's a big capital outlay that the city would have to undertake at some future year to build the park. And so we modeled in, um, you know, so something like three and a half or four million dollars to build like some ball fields and a parking lot. And you and um, but over a 20 year period, it is positive to the city as our fiscal analysis tool comes out. Okay, and was that in our packet? That wasn't in your packet. Okay. Um, and we only brought it to, OSAB because they specifically okay. asked for it and it's just not our, and we can bring, you know, if we continue this tonight um, to the next meeting, we're very happy to bring back that type of information if you want. Okay. Thanks. I think we would like that. Sure. Commissioner Muller. Yeah, thanks. Um, Director Zuccaro, I have a, a question that uh, has come up in many of the comments that we've received from the public on this one and it's um, that, that comment that relates to kind of relates to open space, it's a section of the code 161610, 
uh, the part of the code that says natural features, historic and archaeological sites, vegetation of the area, including trees, must be must be preserved to the extent possible. And as you've seen, many of the uh, comments we received from the public feel like the um, proposal doesn't do that. Would would you? And obviously, you you um, mentioned that that OSAB has approved this. I'm I'm curious. As, as planning staff, did you guys look at this at this section of the code pretty carefully? And if, if so, could you would you comment about yeah. how you how you uh, analyze this section? Yes, um, and as the you know this has evolved over time over a couple of years, but I would just start by oh I'm going to go back <coughs> the image here, so. <coughs> You, you can see that this is the old, what they call disk drive, and there's the, about 160 acres north of that. Yeah. And you can see that was largely left natural compared to the old storage tech site. And there are, you know, you can see vegetation, you can see drainage, um, you know, some ponds, and um, this, is the, this is the irrigation ditch. So you can see much more natural vegetation up on the north side of the property. So as you know, we've worked with the applicant over time on where does the public land dedication go. We've tried to overlay the park and the open space lands over where you see that natural vegetation. Um, it's not the whole 160 acres north of Dis Drive, but it does cover those more natural drainage ways and where you see the majority of the vegetation. And, and so with that, um, your sense is that this, or, or your, you, you see the the proposal meeting that criteria then? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Krantz. Sure, I have more questions regarding whether or not um, it complies with the GDP, but um, just to follow up on what Commissioner Moline was talking about, um, you were pointing to the area where there was drainages and the natural features of the land. What is the, which was the best map? Because when I was looking at this and trying to understand like which trees were going to be removed and which areas were going to be graded, I looked at the grading report in the stormwater management plan. That seemed to be like the best um, way for me to visualize what was, going to, what was going to change in the natural topography when I was wondering if it complied with that exact criteria. And, um, I'm wondering if you could show that map and explain it on that map, or, or if, if, you, if this one is adequate, can you show where the areas are going to be graded? Yep. And so we can see what, um, like, is the, like the way that the stormwater plan showed it, they were going to completely um, rebuild the entire pond. Um, that doesn't seem like preserving a natural feature. Um, so I wanted to see if I could just take a look yeah, at that. that. Yeah, great, great question. The, this pond would be expanded out to the west, and so there would be a lot of uh, disruption to the vegetation out there. Sorry, oh. Uh, I mean, I would it be completely that. drained, or you, you know have what to I'm ask saying? The, you'll have to ask the applicant okay. that. So there, they would be, um, there would be a lot of grading up in this area and disturbance of the vegetation. Um, there, we, we will require restoration plans, um, and our, uh, our open space department is overseeing, um, you know, landscape restoration plans for the areas. Um, but there would be really some significant grading here and here especially, and then around the roads that would encroach into the open space. So those areas would have to be restored. Um, I might have a little bit of a graphic here. Um, this is really hard to see because you're not zooming in. Um, there are better graphics. We'll bring, I'm assuming, you know, at the late hour, we'll probably be continuing. So we'll okay. bring better graphics next time. But up here, there's quite a bit of grading for the drainage, and you can see the pond expansion. And you can see a little bit of encroachment into the open spaces here with the road grading. So what will actually not, what will be left in the state that it is today is what I'm wondering. Like I know there's a, yeah. like the prairie dog towns, we don't have that mapped out on this one, but what would, which area is actually gonna be staying in to the state it is today without being regraded and restored? Right, so I mean there, there's a trail being graded in through this open space, but largely this section of open space 
Um, the 47 acres up here, there are a couple of old houses and other structures that the county is analyzing whether those would stay or if those would be restored. Um, so potentially large parts of the 47 acres, this private common open space would likely stay how it is today. Um, the park land would stay until we developed a park and then that would be regraded and developed potentially as well. Um, around the pond here, so there'd be grading for the underpasses and the road and the trails and the drainage through here. I'd say this area would probably have the most disturbance overall, this tract. Thank you. Additional questions for Director Zakaria? Yeah. Go ahead. <clears throat> I'll just follow the sequence. Um, I want to build on uh, Commissioner Deal's comments about how the open space adds up and the public land. Um, it, could you pull up the public land dedication summary or figure two public land dedication map? Uh, that would be great. Yeah. Is this oh, yeah, that's yeah. perfect. That's got everything on it. Thank you, Rob. Um, so of the 155 acres, I just want to clarify, if, clarify me if I'm wrong. Track C. That's a required buffer zone. That's the open space on the north. Correct. So that's required. Whether you uh, consider that open space or not, that, that's gonna not be able it, to be built. It's a no build buffer, right. yeah. So the, the language in the IGA just says there has to be a buffer from the development. It, the IGA doesn't require it be dedicated open space. Open space, but you won't be able to build there. It you wouldn't be able to build there. It could be, theoretically, it could be private open space. Right. Um, the way the IGA language um, is written, it doesn't require that it's public at all. And but, it will probably yeah. be graded. Okay, then let's go to the tract L. Um, it, you know, when I, I I can imagine that being a berm. Yes. That's, I think that's pretty unusable space. I, I think I see that it is adjacent to 36. I'm not sure how usable that area is. Correct. Um, it is, it would, it, we don't anticipate it would be usable or have much public purpose. The, the berm was created for storage tech and it created a buffer to those developments. Um, you know, but it's, we're not aware of any trail connections right. or anything going. Right. The, the views are incredible up there. But, I bet. Yeah. I bet. And then Paradise Lane. Now, you had mentioned that that's a restricted, restrictive IGA. So that wouldn't be able, even if it wasn't open space, it wouldn't be able to be built on. Yeah, you could build um, under the county's rural zoning and the IGA. I'm, I don't know this the number for sure, but I think it's five homes. You okay. could actually build five new homes out there. Okay, so that's restrictive. So I guess if, if, I'm, op if I'm adding all that up, the 17.07 acres track C, 18 acres of track L, 47.4 acres of Paradise Lane, from the original 155 acres, we get down to 72.53 acres. So I guess I'm just going through the process of, of how much land dedication are we truly because there are areas that you, you just can't build on of a buffer and other things. So it seems like when we had mentioned 4X, well, we're required to dedicate 37.1 acres. This is just over 2X. So when you look at usable space or space that is not going to be built on or, or can't be built on or has limited building on, I think that puts it, maybe answers that question of how much is exactly is open space. And then, and then going back to uh, the other comments, there may be some grading of a lot of this open space. So that clarifies some of that discussion, I think, for all of us. And, and on that point, too, if, if we do end up continuing, maybe we take another shot at just providing clarity on exactly what the net dedication is versus what was already required. Um, I, just the numbers. I'm just trying to get a sense of what was the minimum and where did they end up? Right, yeah, I, I just wanted to add too that oftentimes if you look at our other, develop, other developments around the city, oftentimes open space dedication areas are areas in floodplains, drainage areas, areas that aren't well suited. Um, so um, 
you know, it almost promotes that through some of the standards that we've already talked about as well, that those are the areas that are suited for preservation. It doesn't necessarily mean public. So just keep, so we could bring back some more information too. I mean, there's, lot, there's lots of ways to look at the public land. Certainly, um, some areas clearly couldn't be developed even if it wasn't being dedicated. You know, if you look at some area, I, I brought this up with OSAB a few times as context, because I, um, like the Coyote Run open space within the city, if you actually look at the infrastructure that was built within those open spaces to support the surrounding developments, there are drainage ponds and culverts and, um, you know, different drainage way improvements. Um, and they regraded that pretty significantly and restored it to a natural state. So it doesn't mean that has to happen here, but that is how some developments take place with their public land dedications. Well, just one point of clarity too. I don't know if you heard this, uh, Keaton, but Paradise Lane, that 47 acres you said there, that could be subdivided into five you know, homes. So just to list it under open space, you know, people think that that's, never going to be built on. Right, yes. Yeah, you could build five homes. I think if it's dedicated to the city, it would be, you know, it would be owned by the county. It would be managed as open space or ag land. And we, it's, there's a potential that the structures would be removed or they'd be used for agriculture is the plan. Do we have any additional pressing questions for staff right now? Um, yeah. Well, go ahead. I, I think one of the discussion points, and, and this is my last question, sorry, I, I told you I had a lot of questions. Uh, we had a, a lot of discussion about um, the lead in our, in our final discussion of, of the previous proposal about the leads of building requirements. And that was one of the, one of the finer points as to maybe pushing, pushing on that proposal. Why? Is this just not the timing of, is this just not the time to, to discuss that? Or is that down in the PUD um, discussion points? Why do we avoid the sustainability plan and, and avoiding the lease building requirements and no solar requirements? Right, so I think when you, from staff's perspective, when you're doing a general development plan, the purpose of the plan is to negotiate those types of things, um, to define the character of the development um, and you can create restrictions within the GDP or standards or design standards. And so it all falls within the umbrella of a GDP. Because this isn't a GDP or a GDP amendment and it's, it's just the plat to, to further the 2010 GDP, um, we didn't bring any of that forward from staff's perspective. Commissioner Deal. So just a point of clarity on that. that that means we can't, or can we bring that forward into this development, or is this the the reality of we got lead and you know net net zero and electrification, all those solar requirements into the previous red tail proposal, and that would have moved forward if it wasn't for the vote. But now we're basically left with the Conoco Phillips GDP, which kind of prevents us from putting that in. I'm, I'm not aware of anything within the um, subdivision. I mean, you have all the purpose statements, you have all the design standards. So I would encourage the commission, if you feel like it fits within any of those standards, you can put conditions on plats. Um, usually, though, th there's, there's a section in those design standards um, that really talks more ta towards like bulk and setback I don't know if I put it in. Yeah, I didn't put it in, but it's in the staff report. But in this section of the code, 161275, it talks a little bit about what, so I, um, we could bring it up potentially, but it talks a little bit more specifically about what, sorry, what the commission can add as conditions. Um, so I think there could be conditions things like lead certification and um, solar. I mean, I think it's also worth just having discussion with the applicant and seeing what they're planning to do. Um, and if they're, you know, maybe if they're willing to commit to certain things, but if you want to make it a condition, I think you need to reference against the criteria. 
um, 1612.75. So if you go to B, that, um, maybe that's some relevant language to that. Um, and there may be other things. Does it though, right? I mean, I'm to impose use, height, area, or bulk requirements. Right, so I think that's what I was saying. I think from staff's point of view, those are the clear things that you could potentially make conditions on. Um, if you felt there were some things related to other criteria, you could consider that as well potentially, but I would just ask that you feel like it's necessary to meet some of the design standards or the purposes if you felt that was necessary. But I think this is the language that I've thought of with that question that does provide some guidance on that. Um, if, if I think if there was a condition that you wanted to propose as a group and you weren't quite sure, <laughs> we could certainly get the city attorney's advice on that, but it might be premature. Um, not knowing what potential conditions may be, just to generally, you know, without knowing what the commission may want to apply. All right. Maybe, maybe if we can put the city attorney on notice, as we'll be interested to hear on that. Okay. Concerning what had been provided in the previous, uh, and then we'll take a perhaps a five-minute break and come back to the applicant proposal. Do we have any pressing questions of staff? Um. I do have more questions and I'm just trying to figure out how our procedure is going to work because um, I feel like we've kind of jumped from many different topics and we haven't, you know, I, I still have a couple more things on the open space, a couple more things on the sustainability. And then, um, you know, so I can, I'm just bringing up some general topics, but I'm really hoping to have the chance to drill down on these more. But one of my general questions, maybe just to, to you and to our whole commission is, um, how do we interpret, I know this is not even part of our code, there's nothing in there, but how do we interpret the mandate that was given to us by the voters, um, or what the results of the election were? I mean, because I see places where that could fit in in when we're deciding what is best for the health, safety, and welfare of the community. And I was wondering how we could, you know, how, we, how, do we, how are we supposed to view um, what happened in the election? Our, the, um, you had, there was so much in the staff report and it was so extensive, so I didn't expect that to be in there, but I'm just wondering how are we supposed to put that in our, hold that in our minds? Well, I, I would say the election was a very, it was a very specific election over an ordinance that was specific to a GDP amendment proposal. Mm -hmm. And the application in front of the commission is a final plat that is implementing the 2010 ConocoPhillips campus GDP. So my recommendation is that you apply the criteria in the subdivision code to determine if you feel it complies with yeah. that criteria. Um, the, the, it was just a completely separate application. Yeah, I get that, the, it, but it's so hard because of the number of public comments that we got and the number of people who turned out for the election to just completely view this totally separate from what happened. So I'm, I'm torn about how to just that, I'd be torn to just put that completely out of my mind in considering this application. Can we ask the city attorney perhaps to chime in on this one also? <laughs> Yes, thank you. This is Kathleen Kelly, city attorney. Um, uh, Mr. Zuccaro is absolutely right. The uh, referendum election was on a very specific application and it was a zoning um, action by the city council that was subject to referendum. Under Colorado law, um, zoning actions are considered legislative for purposes of referendum, which is why there was um, the ability for the voters to circulate a petition and have an election. The application before you is on a subdivision plat, which is a completely different type of application, and it is not a legislative matter. Um, and ultimately, the decision of the city council 
on a subdivision plat is not subject to referendum, if that helps you separate the two actions um, in your mind. Really what happened during the election should have no bearing on this subdivision plat application. And um, Commissioner Kranz, as you stated so very well earlier, the decision on this application needs to be based on the evidence presented to you at this hearing judging that evidence against the criteria in the municipal code and the other documents that are incorporated by the ordinances of the city's municipal code so what happened in the election is not relevant to your decision tonight thank you thank you very much uh why don't we take a five minute and we'll come back to additional questions for director zagaro recording stopped
Great, if we can reconvene, please. Just to give folks a kind of feeling of Recording where. Recording in progress. To give folks a feeling uh, for where we're at right now, it's uh, about 8.45. Um, we'll likely continue with uh, commissioner questions for staff. Um, and our, our sense is that probably the easiest way to proceed forward then is for us to continue the meeting until next month, uh, at which time we would have the applicant presentation. And with that presentation kind of fresh in our minds, we would then be able to ask all of our questions and then open it up to public comment um, so that we can kind of have a, uh, have a clean breaking point for the evening. So uh, let's continue then with commissioner questions of staff and we'll see how things go. Thank you all for hanging in here. Commissioner Grant. I just ask yeah. one more. Yeah, um, you had once explained that a preliminary plat is for the whole site and a final plat is usually for one phase and it would have more detail. I wonder if you could help us differentiate between the two parts, maybe help us stay aware of it as we go through the analysis. Um, so I just wanted to see if you could clarify um, which parts we're reviewing as preliminary and which parts as final. Right, yeah, and you know, different plats come through differently. Sometimes plats come through in different filings. Um, and at, at, at one point, I think, um, you know, this plat, I mean, there, there's a preliminary and a final that are coming together. And while some plats come through with different filings that actually address different parts of the property, what's actually being proposed here this evening is a preliminary and final, but they cover the same geographic area. Um, so the actual lots and blocks on both the preliminary and the final are the same in this case. We are anticipating future phases of replats or future filings within those lots, um, but unlike some bigger subdivisions um, that actually pick off different areas of the property, this is the whole property, both preliminary and final. As far as criteria goes, if you look within our code, there's different submittal requirements for a preliminary and final plat, but the criteria for consideration are the same, which are the ones that we talked about. So it's really the application materials. Um, just one example, you, you're supposed to give your drainage plan at preliminary, but at final, um, you're really just finalizing the plat document. There's no requirement for an updated drainage plan. Um, the applicant has chosen to kind of give all of that information together of the submittal requirements for preliminary and final all at once. Does that? Yeah, I just have concerns about what, like in the drainage report, it says that this should not, this is only good for the application that it's, it, it says in the conclusion, it's only good for the application um, at the time, which was back in 2021, and it's not a good for it's not to be used for subsequent um, applications. So therefore, it doesn't seem like it would be ready for a final. I'm just wondering if that would does that would that make a difference in how we would that be necessary to change for a final plat? So. Um Specifically on the drainage report, and I'd have to pull up, maybe I could, and I might pull up the exact language just because we want to be specific here, I think. Um, I think in the preliminary plat, it does talk about having a drainage report, and I think I said final. I think if we actually pull up the language, it says it just needs to be preliminary, but let's pull up the language. But usually how these things happen. I didn't mean to pick on that one specifically. I was just saying the kind of things that come through my mind when I was asking the more general question. Okay, um, well, so with a, the way, the way plats usually work is, you know, once the plat is approved too, we have construction documents and we have drainage reports for the actual construction of the drainage improvements that go through our public works department that are really the final plans that get adopted and approved for construction. Um, so I think what our code, and I'm going to have Lisa verify this, but I think the submittal requirements for a uh, preliminary plat include a drainage plan, and that final plat doesn't actually require that you update the drainage plan, if I recall correctly. And I don't know if you want to get that specific. It sounds like maybe not about the drainage plans. 
So this section up here is 1612050, preliminary plat contents. So I'll kind of scroll through. So it says preliminary drainage plan is P. And then if you go down to the final plat, um, it says what has to be submitted for a final plat. And I think in, in any case, at this point in time, what we're provided with is a preliminary drainage plan, right? Yes, there is a drainage plan. I think it was titled final drainage plan, but I, we could pull it up and see. And I think that's why I was referencing it as final. But it is not final. It will be amended through the public works review process. Yeah, and in any case, this is not construction documents, not right. even close to it, so. But thank you, this is a great example of how I'm trying to understand what we're supposed to review for a final versus a preliminary, so. We have additional questions for Director Zaccaro? If you have any. Commissioner Deal? No? Commissioner Howe? None at this time? No more? Because that, with that, actually, then we're going to be concluding our meeting. If we find put, I sure, mean, we'll sure, go Brian, through the process. Yeah. Not a question, but maybe just for the record and for everybody involved, we talked about a number of things that we would uh, have it kind of at the, the next meeting. I just was just going to list those for uh, so everybody has them. But uh, the uh, financial model, um, I'm going to be interested in, in, in maybe we spend a little time if you have it, but understanding a little more detail of the intersection at 96th in Campus Drive. Um, I think that's probably the most impact, impacted intersection. Uh, the open space clarity that we talked about, um, you know, interested in hearing this about sustainability and then that mineral rights question. So just five things that we'll you know, want to definitely cover next time. And, and um, I guess one thing, I'll, I'll just, that's a great idea. I appreciate this, uh, Commissioner Deal. One of the things that I was um, thinking about earlier this evening was the way we are, the, the way the city credits open space and um, I can't remember, I think there's something in the code about if there's certain kinds of improvements, drainage improvements or something, there, there's like, is there like a calculation about how that those, if an area has an open space designation but it also has uh, some particular drainage improvements, for example, on it, it might, that might influence the, the calculation about that, yeah? Yeah, that's a good question. We didn't, there is a, you can do kind of a net Oh, okay. Public land dedication okay. where you net out easements Got and those it. types of things. Yes. And so we can bring you the net number netting out easements. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I think we're... Which, which, which is in addition to, to understanding yeah. what development restrictions are already on the open space properties. Yeah. With the understanding that, you know, I'm, I'm sure we're, we're going to still well exceed or the, the current proposal well exceeds that required amount, so... Sure, go ahead. Uh, um, are we we're talking about information that might be useful for next time? Um, I saw some, it might be comparing apples to oranges, but in the transportation, um, the big transportation um, analysis that was for the previous development had a transportation goal, I think of one of them had a transportation goal of 12%, and then in the transportation um, demand management plan, it had mentioned a goal of 25%. I can't remember which way, but I wonder if we can come back with some clarity on what the transportation demand, what, what is the um, reduction in single occupancy vehicles? What are the goals um, in those two plans? Because there wasn't anything specific in the traffic analysis letter. It might be something we could ask the applicant to clarify for us. Great. Uh, with that then, I would entertain a motion. Oh, we have uh, Commissioner Howe. Well, I guess while we got the time, we might as well just ask you one last question here. Um, I guess I would also like just some clarification on the traffic. Um, this would be table two. 
I, I know we, we talked briefly about it, but it seems like the, there are some changes in the, in the traffic, some increases in the traffic patterns. Um, maybe we could spend just a little bit more time on there. Um, and, and I think to, to back up what Commissioner Deal said, the, the 96 intersection, it just seems really close to the E470 intersection. And I guess I'm concerned about the proximity and exactly how that's gonna work. It, it seems like you have one light and then you'll have another light very close by and, and whether there's alternatives to that, I'm sure that's been thought out and I'm not a traffic consultant, but it seems like it, it would be a lot of heavy traffic in a short period of road. Yep. We'll bring back, in, we have some information on those intersection distances and stacking and all of that. Yeah. Any additional questions for staff? Uh, just to follow up point. on Commissioner <laughs> House, could you um, could you bring give us for the record um, the discuss uh, dis the discussion that was in the city council meeting regarding um, the question about the interchange at 96 um, stacking up around the fire station? Um, that was something that was discussed in one of the city council meetings and. I don't know that it got resolved, but if we could have that as part of our yeah, we, um, discussion. Yeah, we hired, a, so we, the city hired a, you know, a third party traffic engineer to analyze that specific question of stacking. Uh, you know, the, tra the modeling is just a little different, um, but we, we, so we have that baseline information that we had our third party traffic engineer do to analyze the stacking distances and see if there were any conflicts between the intersections. So we'll dig that up and see if it needs to be refreshed or if it's if we feel like it's adequate to answer your questions for next time. This is not a comment yeah, for, no. uh, for, for you, Rob, but do we need to enter these uh, public? Um, we'll, we'll wait until we open the public hearing. Into, in, into the- And we enter the public comment okay. during that time, yep, thank you. So sorry, but just to follow up on Commissioner Deal's question, um, the financial analysis that we had from the previous development um, didn't include the idea of a hospital and a medical center. And I'm wondering if, if in the financial information that you're bringing us now, it would incorporate um, the effect of having a nonprofit, if it would be a nonprofit proposed use on the revenue generated to the city. Yes, we could make, we've done that in the past where we make some adjustments with those assumptions. Great. No, the, the, the questions, this is the perfect time for questions, thank you. It's also good for my range of motion in my neck. I'm trying to increase that, so no problem there. All right, any additional questions for staff at this time? All right, with that, I would entertain a motion to uh, continue to September 8th. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries unanimously. We will continue our discussions then. Uh, at this time then, do we have anybody on Planning Commission who has some comments that they wanted to share with the group? Seeing none, any staff comments? Um, no comments this evening. We, I think we have, maybe we have some information on the advanced uh, agenda items, uh, but if there aren't any questions on that. No, and, and for now your advanced agenda item is retail. Yeah. <laughs> All right, great, thank you very much. Um, with that then, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you all. Thank you all for coming this evening. Look forward to seeing everybody next month.